you doing? Not too bad. What does the Bible say about abortion? That says a lot of things, but how do you want to, I mean, where do you want to start with something well, like this? We'll, uh, we'll see where we go tonight, but um, yeah, we, we were uh, talking about what the Bible has to say about abortion. A couple of pastors for the first time ever on the What Does the Bible Say About series, so yeah, kind of scary, huh? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hopefully, hopefully the bandwidth can handle all of our ordained knowledge that's coming at right. you. <laughs> am I am I glowing right now or anything? Yeah, there's a there's an indicator that's blinking on my screen that says uh, um, this guy should be listened to. <laughs> now I think you're right. Uh, what does the Bible say? I think that's the key word here. What does the Bible say about abortion? I think that's uh, that should be our track for this session. Yeah, very very timely. And um, I think it's two weeks ago now that uh, Roe v. Wade was overturned here in the United States. And if you're like me and you're on social media of any kind, or even just watching the news, you can hear the uh, the the hatred that goes back and forth between the two different stances on abortion. And so we talked about taking this topic on, and we we're we're not going to get into the politics. We're not going to get into the U.S. legal code. We're going to go to God's word and and see what he has to say about life. Um, and uh, we're just gonna let God speak. And um, I, I, I was gonna say off air before we start, but kind of just to prime uh, my counterpart here, um, I, I do think it's important to answer the question, why, why should Christians have an opinion on abortion? And so maybe we can cap off with that when we get to the end. Okay, and I, hey, where do we wanna start? Uh, yeah. we we'll start with Psalm 139, actually. I. I just sent on a newsletter talking about these verses in Psalm 139. Uh, it's a good place to start uh, concerning when does life begin and who does the creating, ultimately. Right. Yeah, well, well, let's go there and hear what the scriptures say. So Psalm 139, um, where do you want to pick up? You want to go to verse 13 right away? or? Yeah, I'd say I, uh, I would say let's go through verses 13 and through 13 through 17 would be a good place to start. How'd you read that for us? For you formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. My frame was hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed substance in your book were written every one of them, the days that were formed for me, when as yet there was none of them. How precious to me are your thoughts, O God! How vast is the sum of them! Yeah, you, you missed an important word. Your my frame was not hidden from you. You said my frame was hidden from you, but oh, I'm verse, sorry. No, you're fine. Verse uh, verse 15. I didn't want to was interrupt. Was not you. hidden from. Yes, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, so this, I mean, it's its so clear, this uh, beautiful, uh, beautiful words. I, I think these are often shared with uh, um, pregnant mothers and, and um, even, even um, I'm, I'm trying to think of people who find the most comfort from, I. this is one of my favorite Psalms to go to day to day. Um, not even just these verses, which talk about the importance of life, but um, all of the Psalm talks about the the, the presence of God, the, the knowledge of God, the uh, um, the inability to hide from God. And, and so it's not just a, a day to day as we live in our, our life right now and our vocations, our context that we're in, but from the very beginning when the only context and vocation we, we knew was that of our mother womb and, and the vocation we had was to be fed and nourished um, and, and nurtured, but, but God was the, the author, um, the one who was doing the work in that place. And, and it's just a beautiful thing to meditate on and to, to acknowledge. Yeah, it's, it's, if you have a Lutheran study Bible, it has some great notes on this section. Uh, like beginning with 13, because, you know, why well, could verse 13 right out the bat? David acknowledges the fact that it was God who formed him from his inward parts, or is, uh, or I think that the study Bible note has the, uh, the ball, his biological complexity, you know, uh, getting down to that level from the very, from the moment he was conceived, God was forming him. And so that would tell us right off the bat that life begins at conception with that. Yeah, right. And it kind of moves along and, and 
like verse 14 is wonderful too. I praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. You can't help but think about, you know, with, with children who are born with special needs, you know, or maybe they have a deformity, yet they're still wonderfully made by God. This is great news for right. parents and children that, you know, who, who are struggling with these things, uh, that they're still precious in the sight of God because he's the one who created them. But I like this one that I like 15. Um, my frame was not, there I corrected, not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. The study note here has an interesting comment this depths of the earth is metaphor for the womb. Yeah, right. Which is, again, pinpoints when all this is happening uh, from conception in the womb. Yep. You know, places uh, has for, for God's activity. Um, but then in, in 16, but it's got an interesting note here, too. It says, your eyes form my unformed substance. In your book were written every one of them. Some scholars see this book as the, uh, the DNA code. Oh, really? How, you know, how it, it, God puts that information in there to direct how David was formed. Yeah. It's I'm pretty, I mean, it's, that. I've never heard that before, though. That's an interesting uh, interpretation. Yeah, right. Uh, again, though, with all this, it shows that God is in control. He is the one who, from the from conception, from the moment, uh, he, he he does everything. Right. Yeah. There, there's there's a lot of places we can go. I, I think one passage that fits very well with this uh, comes in Jeremiah chapter one verse five, and uh, uh, Jeremiah. Uh, this is right at the beginning of Jeremiah in chapter one, of course, but the word of the Lord came to me saying, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you. I appointed you a prophet to the nations. There's a, again, this, uh, just to point out, this isn't the only place uh, in scripture. The, um, Ecclesiastes 11 verse five, as you do not know the way the spirit comes to the bones in the womb of a woman with child, so you do not know the work of God who makes everything. There's, there's so many places in, in scripture that point us to God's creative work in the womb. And, and the other one that comes to mind, and I should have looked this up, is um, in sin did my mother conceive me. Um, yeah. It isn't necessarily a positive reflection on it, but that I think there's a um, definitely something to be taken from that, that uh, a couple of things to be taken from that, 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 um, that talks about the conception as an important part, but also that that sinful nature is is there um, at conception as well. That that we have this identity as humans that that comes from that very first moments in in the womb. And um, so Scripture's pretty clear on that. What th those are all Old Testament places. I was going to look to see um, in sin did my mother conceive me. Let's see. That's a, one of the Psalms. Psalm fifty one verse five. Um, so so that was. Um, that's one. What what about the New Testament? Where, where do we go in the New Testament for? Well, before I before we jump there quick, I want to add just one more thing. I, I it caught me when you were reading Jeremiah one uh, one four and five there um, or five. It says before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before I, I consecrated you, I appointed you a prophet to nations. What that tells me that God even He just doesn't create haphazardly, but He creates with a purpose, mm. which is also something. It's it's. Uh, and, and, you know, just as Jeremiah, we all have a purpose right? from conception that, that God puts forward, you know, for us to, to do, which gives life meaning. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Right. Yeah, that's it's a beautiful reality to, to revel in. And um, even Isaiah or Psalm 139 that we started with, the days were fashioned for me um, before they began. Um, you, the Lord knew all the days, knows all the days for for his creation and he desires um them to be lived <laughs> this is uh no no deep getting to you asked me about the new testament uh well we you always have the classic with mary visiting elizabeth yeah uh, yeah that, that's a you know if you want to go there and next and let's look at this if you'd like yeah no luke chapter one is is where that's at right <laughs> yes 139, but also it, right before that, uh, you have this wonderful promise that God is speaking. You know, you're going to have a son. His name is going to be John. He's, you're going to be, he's going to be filled from, filled with the Holy Spirit. 
from his mother's womb. Yeah. Which is a great passage. We're kind of segues into what we're going to look at now. Yeah. Yeah, so John, uh, Luke 1, verse 39 says, In those days Mary arose and went with haste into the hill country to a town in Judah, and she entered the house of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth. And, was, and when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary, the baby leaped in her womb. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit, and she exclaimed with a loud cry, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And why is this granted to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For behold, when the sound of your greeting came to my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. And blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her from the Lord. Yeah. What's going on there? What can we take from well, that? You, <laughs> well, you have the embryo Jesus coming to visit the six-month-old John. Six-month embryo. Yeah. Gee, John. Well, yeah, you get what well, John's probably they figure about six months old at this point. I've heard this a long time ago. It went from five to six months old, where you had Jesus, who's now an embryo, just to be, he was just conceived. Now, now wait a second. Me. You're telling me that, um, are you saying John was born at this point? No, no, John, I'm sorry. John was, okay. he was six months. He was six, six months, months along old in the pregnancy. Born. Yeah. Yes, yeah. yes. Okay. And uh, so, yeah, I mean, you have embryo Jesus coming to visit six month old in the womb, John. And he leaps for joy. Mm -hmm. Now, if if somebody can have joy at six months old in the womb, yeah, I would say that's life. Yeah, that's right. just not something. It's a a bunch of flesh and cells. Yeah, yeah, no, and that's uh for for me, it's that that's a great reality to have there, great realization to have there. But uh, the Holy Spirit is able to work upon that clump of cells yeah. no that human in the womb right. and um and and that's what the holy spirit does for us it, it works faith and, and i love this story as a great example for what we bring to the table when it comes to acknowledging jesus as our savior um we we don't make that decision the holy spirit moves us to to believe and and moves us to confess as as uh, john confessed through his leaping um now uh, you, of course you get the skeptics who say well that was just elizabeth's um quaint thoughts about what was going on as the baby kicked when Jesus happened to show up and it was a coincidence that she took a conclusion from it. Um, and I'll, I'll just be blunt about it. People who say such things have a low view of scripture. Yep. We don't have a low view of scripture and I'm not going to argue against the low view of scripture. I'm just going to say that I don't, I don't agree with that. Um, when, when the Holy Spirit inspires not just faith in the hearts of believers, we, we acknowledge that work of the Holy Spirit, but when the Holy Spirit inspires the scriptures that we have preserved for our reading, for our learning, we also acknowledge that as, as God's word to us as truth. And so um, we can take this as God's honest truth and, and, and rejoice in it and, and take comfort and, and knowledge from knowing yeah. that life begins before birth. I think that's important to, to hammer down our source of authority. I mean, it, right. we hold to the Reformation principle of sola scriptura, scripture alone. And and because if you get away from scripture, the next thing you know, you're you're opening up the doors to other thoughts that are based on ever changing standards. Right. Uh, when when is a child viable? You know, at one time it was at birth. Now they're thinking. I've heard some people say horrendously say and believe and think that now life is only viable if they can actually take care of themselves. Yeah. It's always a shifting standard. Yeah. But with, yeah, with the scriptures, we have a set standard that God spoke it. That's it. Yeah. 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 The, um, the, uh, the, the, and the thing too, if you start giving up, giving room for, human reason human rationalism to come into interpreting scripture it, not only this question about abortion and life and when life begins um gets up for grabs but things such as um the forgiveness of sins the resurrection of the body the life everlasting our only hope as christians um really come in are quick to to wh where where do we stop drawing the line if we're going to start questioning the truths of scripture and as as like i said as people who take god's word as god's word we we let god's word stand even when it's difficult so and, and i think that's part of the the problem with um the abortion argument and i don't want to get too 
too accusatory or, or polemical about it, but, but when we start to say, well, this prevents a difficulty from the mother happening, so we do this hard thing. And, and a lot of time abortion advocates will say abortion is not ideal, but it prevents a, a greater evil. But, but never are we called to, to do an evil in order to prevent uh, what we perceive might right. be evil. And because the, the ultimate reality is, is we don't know the days that God has ordained for, for somebody who's not been born yet. And I, I rejoice that I'm, I'm closely af affected by a story that, that could have been an abortion story in, in my life. And if you want to know that, you can talk to me in person about it. But there's time after time you hear stories of, of inspirational hope that have flourished from situations that would have been detrimental or, or devastating. And um, it, I, it's, 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 it's hard to imagine what the world would be like if abortion wasn't so accepted. And um, it's, it's hard to have those thoughts, but we are where we are. And, and um, I'll, I'll just cut to the, to the chase here. I, I do pray and I, I hope that, you know, with the, the things that have been handed down from the Supreme Court as it's handed over to the states to make these decisions, that we can see this, this flourishing of life and, and the gifts that flow from these babies that might have otherwise not been born um, because of what's happened. Yeah, and I, I think it, uh, again, you know, what does the Bible say about abortion? As we go forth in, in our message uh, to our friends, family, and neighbors, to, you know, this issue is going to be around for a while, this topic. Right. That, that we, it's mostly, I mean, it's, it's, it's so important that we do speak from the scriptures as us Christians. Right. Because if we go, if we get into the realm of, well, is the, is it right to have the states to have that right? Or is it a federal mandate? It, you're not going to win that argument. Right. It, it's a fruitless argument. I'm, don't be wrong. I'm glad too that uh, from a standpoint of curbing evil in society, we got rid of Roe versus Wade. It's a, right. it's a step in the right direction. But ultimately, though, we have to change people's hearts about this understanding. Right. And why we're curbing the evil and, and that can only be done through scripture. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And, and I, I like that you said hearts have to be changed. Uh, and I'll tweak it just a little bit. We have to be putting God's word into people's ears so that God can change hearts. Yes. And, right. and um, so that's there. Um, so we've kind of identified we've looked at what, you know, places in scripture where we get an indication that life begins at conception. Um, now now that we have shown from scripture where where life begins um i think it's important for us to understand god's command about life and so can we go to the commandment the fifth commandment as we number them um which is the one that speaks closest to it you go on to the exodus 20 passage or just go to the catechism um let's go to the catechism um as it's pulled directly from exodus 20 and deuteronomy 6 where those commands are listed uh but the catechism gives us a little more with it yeah so. well what is the? i'll start out what is the fifth commandment you should not murder what does this mean we should fear and love god that so that we not hurt or harm our neighbor in his body but help and support him in every physical need yeah and I, and I love that this commandment, uh, Luther's explanation of this commandment, because especially in this conversation, because this, this not only um, gives us a curb against abortion, not only gives us a mirror to show us when uh, murder is wrong, because it, it is, but it also gives his explanation, as, as all of the explanations for the commandment do, they, they give us the positive of what we now do in Christ, that, that guide that we have of we help and support in every physical need. And so it's, it's great for this question of abortion because it doesn't just protect the life of the unborn child, but it also goes to how do we then support the, the mother who's bearing an unborn child and, and, and that who might be tempted towards a, a abortion because of a variety of circumstances. And we don't have to enumerate all those. I think we're all familiar enough with all the conversations that have been going on these days when people consider abortion but a lot of those situations are places where that mother's life needs support. And, and so the, I think the, the positive side of, of Christians, and I think um, a lot of times Christians are, are uh, called out for, you, you speak against abortion, but you don't speak for um, life and, and the, the, the life that happens after birth. And I, I think that's patently false. If you just look at the history of the church and the, the present yeah. day of the church, the, the number of organizations that we do, 
and, and I, it, it's easy for us to defend ourselves, but I, but I think it is a good call to action as well to say, we could do more and, and we should do more to, to support these, these mothers, these families that are in these situations where, where they might see, think that this is their only option or their best option. Um, we, we can provide through the gifts that God's given us in this world, an opportunity for, for a better route. You know, I always wonder, you, you've made me think about something. You know, when people say that, well, it, this is why I'm pro-choice because, you know, we, we don't do nothing to help the child after birth. I, I really wonder, is that the reason? Yeah, I, I mean, I, it, you know, it's, I, it's easy for me to sit here and, and judge. Um, and, and, I, and I feel like these, it's easy for us to just throw this out there without you know, probably to um, welcoming ears or friendly ears, at least. But um, I, I think if if you pushed me on it, I would say no. It's probably just a um, a, a guilt averting argument. You know, they, they try to say, well, um, I, I I think that's ultimately what it is. For for me, I I think the um, the drive for abortion is it's a it's a selfish. Um, it's a selfish drive. It's a, I don't want my life to be negatively impacted in ways that I think it might be because of a child coming along or for bearing the, the shame that might come with it in a variety of circumstances. And, and none of those are easy conversations. And so it's, like I said, it's easy for us to sit here and to just put this out on the internet. Um, but I think the, the more important and the harder thing to do is to have those relationships and, and be in those communities where these conversations can happen when it matters, when, when it's being considered to, to provide God's truth in a situation that, that is hearing the world's options and, and those aren't the best. Yeah, and, and this is probably where I get a little more, I get theological from a 30,000 foot view a little bit, but I think when people do find themselves in circumstances in life, whether it be, you know, they find themselves pregnant or single or some other circumstance that hits them, and now they have choices to make. What am I going to do? And, and for many of them, either either with the law that's written on their heart, or whether they grew up in a Christian church and they've been exposed to the faith, and they, and they may be believers, but ultimately, it's always it's going to come about what you want to do versus what God's will is. Mm -hmm. Right. Ultimately, that's what it always comes down to. And and the, I mean. And sometimes those decisions to go with God's will comes with hard circumstances and burdens, you know, and God never promises to take away these burdens or these circumstances, but he does promise to sustain us through them. Right. And, and those things always drive us back to him anyways, to the cross. Yeah. And, and I, I, I really do. I think from, from that standing back from that looking down, uh, that's always what it comes down to. Is it my will versus God's will? Right. Yeah. And that, that's what I was saying with the selfish. Yes. Yeah, it comes in there. And, and really, ultimately, you're you're putting yourself in the place of God, which which this commandment and, and other places in Scripture clearly uh, show that God is the author of life. He's the one who gives life. He's the one who takes away life. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Uh, that's that's the Lord's purview he is the one who who gives and takes life and we don't know when that is and we oftentimes we we scratch our heads or even shake our fists and in, in angst because of how could this be um, but we we let the lord be the one who's in control of our life and so we've talked a lot about obviously because this is about what does the bible say about abortion but a lot of these same arguments that especially that argument applies to the end of life because we also yeah. have this other side of the spectrum where we have physician assisted suicide and, and allowing um, where it's allowed where people can say well my life isn't worth living anymore so I'm just going to end it and it's it's just tragic to to think of the opportunities um, that are removed because you don't allow yourself to be cared for and and to be loved by those who who love you and and um, there was a um, this was big in the news a while back. Uh, Maggie Carner was the director of life ministries for the uh, Lutheran Church Missouri Synod. And there was a woman in, um, and I'm going to butcher this story, but there was a woman in, I think, Washington State, Seattle I think, area, I think. And, and she had been diagnosed with glioblastoma, terrible cancer that ravaged her brain. And 
um, she very publicly made a statement that said, I'm not going to let this cancer kill me. I'm going to end my life on my terms. And almost within the same, well, within the same time period, Maggie Carner, the director of life ministries for the LCMS was diagnosed with the same exact condition. And, and she wrote a letter um, very publicly, obviously it didn't get as much treatment or, or traction in the media, but um, talking about how she is going to let God be the one who determines her days. And um, talked about the beauty of letting her family care for her at the end of her life. And um, and then after she died, her, her daughter got on um, and put a YouTube video out there and um, just a beautiful testimony to what that meant to be able to care for her mother in that tragic circumstance. But that but that's what we're called to do. We're called to care for each other. And if we um, see ourselves in a difficult situation or we see a difficult situation, and we say, oh, well, that, that person or that life is going to take more effort to care for than is worth caring about. Um, all, all of a sudden, we're abandoning our call, God's gift to us to love our neighbors, to, to care for those in need around us. And, and we're saying, no, we, we would rather focus on what we want and, and what we think would be best for us instead of taking what, what comes our way and, and living as best we can with the Lord's blessing upon our life. No, thank you for sharing that. Sir. I forgot all about that. That happened a while back. Though, didn't yeah. I remember. But, uh, but again, it shows that that even if your days, you know, you're deteriorating, say you have dementia or Alzheimer's, God still has a purpose for you. There's there's meaning in life. Right. And and that purpose may be to allow others to, to take care of you. Right. You, you know, and that was a blessing for the caregivers. Yeah. As well. But, you know, getting back, you made a good comment about there's, you know, the abortion issue also has end of life things as well. And it. it it's sad you're already hearing out like in european countries and some of the european countries you don't even get to make that choice when i end my life in some countries they're actually making that choice for you you're right with other family you know family members so it shows how this uh, there's a common thread between uh the low value of life if you uh, if you're pro-choice also that kind of carries over a lot of times the end of life issues yeah which is put the horse down. It's no longer good. That's the mentality. I right. hate to be blunt this way, but that's kind of where it goes. Yeah. It's right. the same thought process. Yeah. Um, yeah. No, it's a, it's a, for me, it's easy to see. And, 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 and um, I, I, I just pray that the Lord would open eyes to, to hear not just this truth about life and his, his desire for life in all circumstances, but also, um, to, to know the, the fullness of the gospel and the comfort of the gospel. And, and, and that's one place where I, I, I think this conversation is important to go to as well is what does the Bible say about abortion? Well, the Bible has something to say about people who have uh, carried out an abortion, whether, whether you're an abortion doctor or whether you're a, a woman who's had an abortion. Um, what does the Lord have to say in those circumstances? Well, we, only, we know that there's only one unforgivable sin. And that's unbelief, rejection of, you know, refusing the Holy Spirit to work on you. Right. Um, other than that, any sin can be forgiven, laid at the foot of the cross. Jesus died for that sin, just like any other sin. Right. Whether it's an abortion doctor or, or a woman who, who had an abortion, a couple that who went through and, you know, agreed to have this done, that there is forgiveness in Jesus Christ. Yeah. Yeah, and, Psalm, Psalm 103, 10 and 12, God does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities, for as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his steadfast love toward those who fear him. And as far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove his transgression, our transgressions from us. Um, and Psalm 130, but if you, O Lord, should mark iniquities, O Lord, who could stand, but with you there is forgiveness that you may be feared. Um, yeah. yeah, this... That, that, that question was one that helped me or helps me see um, the distinction in the application of law and gospel. Um, so have you heard this scenario, a, a, a young couple or a young woman comes into your office and says, pastor, is abortion a sin? And um, determining how to answer that question involves listening. Um, so you can't answer that question um, appropriately without knowing the context. If this woman is considering an abortion, then she needs to hear, yes, it is a sin. But if this woman has uh, carried out an abortion and is, you know, 
dealing with that consequences, she doesn't need to hear it's a sin. She needs to hear she's forgiven. And so for, for me, it's a, it's a careful question for us to, to walk into because we don't want to say it's okay, but at the same time, we don't want somebody to live with the guilt in the fear of God, knowing that, that they may have done wrong, that, that God has sent his son Jesus to die for all the deaths that we have caused. And, um, and we, we're all guilty of the fifth commandment when we haven't helped our neighbor in every way we could or, or opportunities that we've overlooked or ignored. Um, that, that's, that's something that we, we need to be careful about and, and also uh, bring to the cross and let Jesus uh, shed blood cover that sin for us. Yeah, and I think if you do have that scenario where someone comes into your office and asks that question and say they had an abortion, 99.99% of them uh, are already bearing that guilt. Mm -hmm. Or that's why they wouldn't ask the question. Now, you might have that one one off rare moment that someone actually had an abortion. They don't feel guilt over it. And they're just trying to affirm what they did is okay. Right. Yeah, But that doesn't happen very often. I think that's a very rare situation. Yeah. I think uh, most people who, who come into a pastor's an office for, for a reason, they, they aren't. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, they're going there for a reason. They, they need comfort from the gospel. Uh, they're seeking that. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, uh, and I really feel for women who, who don't turn to Christ, you know, to, you know, have done, you know, gone through this and they're bearing that guilt. And there, and and you see the devastating, you know, devastating effects it can have on some people over time. Right. You know, it's just a, it's a weight that just keeps getting heavier and heavier. And you can try all kinds of ways to to alleviate the pain and the guilt and and turn to probably some un probably not some very helpful healthy practices to try to alleviate that guilt as well. And it, yep. it, a lot of times it just doesn't. Either their conscience is going to get super hardened and and seared or they're going to just spiral into this this uh i don't know this black hole of guilt and shame and just cannot find a way to deal with it yeah yeah and so if you're if you're struggling with that guilt if you clicked across this video because you're struggling with it give us a uh shoot us a message drop us a, a note um get to us at our church phone numbers whatever you want to do we'd, we'd love to talk um talk about it with you because the lord has hope he has got a promise for you and uh at the same time if you know someone in your life who's wrestling with this and you're struggling what do you say um you don't have to bear that conversation alone point them to a, a local pastor or if you need help finding one uh, we'd be happy to help with that um i do i do want to take that that question i threw out there at the beginning and maybe um, unless you got some other thoughts we can kind of conclude with that so why is it important for christians to have an opinion about abortion um, I think since from the beginning of the Christian church and, and well, throughout all biblical times, it was always the Christians who um, not only had an opinion, but they acted on their opinion. Uh, just during the Roman times that, you know, when unwanted children were thrown over a cliff and left to die, it was the Christians who came and, you know, helped the ones who survived and, and took them and adopted, adopted them into their own family and raised them as their own. and. Um, I think it's, a, we have to have an opinion. We have to back it with our actions, right? We yeah. actually uh, do what we say and say what we do. No, no, it, that, thank you. You answered the way I, I knew you would, but you took it further, which I, I needed to hear as well, that, um, it's one thing to have an opinion, but we, we do look for those opportunities to support life and, um, help and support it in every physical need. Um, that's, that's yeah. what it's called to do. Yeah. Right. No, it's uh, and we someone has to stand up for the unborn. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean it's you, uh, you talk about the the voiceless minorities or the the demographic without a a, a voice or a foot to stand on. That's that's probably it. Probably. No, they're the most vulnerable amongst us. Right. Uh, you know, it's supposed to be the safest place in the world is the mother's womb. Yeah. And, and if it can't be a safe place, it has to speak out against it. Right. And yep. look, look at all the other issues that are going out there, too. We, we Christians have to, you know, it's one thing, I think, in some sense, we try to, to go along to get along. You know, we'll tolerate each other. But I think we're now ready at a point where 
you know, toleration is not going to work for certain groups. Yeah. They want to be affirmed and celebrated and, and their actions and, the, and their beliefs. And now the sparks are starting to fly. Yeah. And so what do we do as Christians? Do we run and hide in a corner? Do we stand out front on the front lines and be the church militant? Right. And speak no. the truth of God's word clearly and plainly as it's supposed to be. And yeah, we, we, we're, we're not going to celebrate sin, but we, we will celebrate the life that somebody has. And and, right. and that's the thing that I, I think I, I wish we could have those conversations because I feel like they would be beautiful, fruitful conversations if we entered into them faithfully to say every life is worth celebrating. Every life is a gift from God. Every life is valuable to God. And, and I think that's the message that the world's not hearing because because we we say a sin is a sin and, and we stand against it. Um, and and of course, we get called out for being sinners at the same time, which we definitely are. But but we have the gift of life that comes from God, um, this earthly life. But but more importantly, we have eternal life in store for us. And that's the joy that we get to point others to. And um, I, I just pray that walls will come down. And, and I think you're right in identifying that that there's many things happening in the world today where um, the, the church's articulation of things um, is is confrontational. Um, but but it's it's um, it's confessing the truth of Scripture and. And that's, as, as I said, I'm not going to argue whether or not scripture is worth believing or not. I believe it is. And so that's where I'm going to stand. And, and that's how I'm going to approach the world. And, and that's not as easy as it's been in, in centuries yeah. previous, but we are uh, still called to be faithful. You talk about rejoicing, but you know, we also rejoice that with the whole company of heaven, when a sinner repents and turns to Christ for the forgiveness of their sins. Yeah, praise the Lord. Yeah. We all can rejoice together because we're all in the same boat together when it comes yeah. to that. Yeah. yeah. So. Well, what do you, what do you got? <laughs> anything, anything else you want to throw out there on this? No, I think it's a, it's a heavy topic. It is. Yeah, it we, is. we might have offended somebody. And if we did, uh, sorry, not sorry, but we'd love to love to dialogue if you have uh, words. Um, just one, one thing is uh, I think I've been encouraging personal conversations and i i cringe when i see people flaming at each other on facebook and other places because hearts aren't going to change and and lives aren't going to uh, be saved i think by internet arguments but I, I think these personal conversations are worth having um in person as much as possible and and uh so if you if you want to talk on the phone or even get together be happy to to lend an ear no that's uh I can't, I can't add anything else to that. That's well said. Yeah. All right. Well, let us know if you got any questions or follow-ups on this. We are uh, glad to be back with you guys. It's been a few weeks off and I, uh, not sure about our schedules for the next couple of weeks, but we're going to be throwing these out as often as we can and hopefully get back into a regular routine, uh, uh, with these. So good to be with you and God's blessings on you. Yes. Blessings. Blessings.